When we think of nuclear power, we think of this. But if this happens, why do we still use it? Atoms release tremendous amounts of energy when the nucleus of an atom splits into separate parts, called nuclear fission, or when nuclei fuse together, called nuclear fusion. So, how do we discover nuclear energy? Well, it all started with a French guy named Henri Becquerel. In 1896, he accidentally discovered that pitch blend, a type of uranium salt, emitted some sort of energy because the photographic plate near the substance had darkened on its own. Wee oui, wee, oui, he exclaimed, for this was not boring old x-rays, but a new type of energy, radioactive decay. The substance emitted three different entities, beta particles, also known as electrons, alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, and gamma rays, which are rays with the highest frequency on the electromagnetic spectrum. Next, in 1905, Albert Einstein discovered the famous relationship between matter and rest energy, E equals mc squared. We'll learn about the crucial role this equation played in the development of nuclear energy and nuclear reactors soon. Then, James Chadwick discovered the neutron in 1932, a particle that had no electric charge. Then, in 1938, Enrico Fermi and his colleagues found that uranium atoms spontaneously split into separate parts. A few months later, Lisa Mader and Otto Frisch calculated the amount of energy released from a fission event. Eventually, in 1942, Enrico Fermi finally developed the first nuclear reactor. So, how do these nuclear processes emit energy? Well, it's all due to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. Alpha decay occurs when a nucleus splits and releases two protons and two neutrons. But how does this process release energy? You know that the number of protons and neutrons before and after the process don't change, implying that the masses before and after don't either. Well, it turns out, the masses before and after aren't actually the same. When measuring the mass of the initial nucleus versus the mass of the final nucleus, an alpha particle, we see that mass is lost through this interaction. So how is this possible? Well, some of this lost mass is converted into kinetic energy for the alpha particle to shoot out. Intuitively, it makes no sense for two identical particles to have different masses. In classical mechanics, when two identical blocks of mass m collide with each other, they form a bigger block of mass 2m. The kinetic energy from these two blocks is just dissipated as heat. But in relativity, the two blocks are in a vacuum, so they just can't lose their kinetic energy to heat because there's nowhere for the heat to move to. So the kinetic energy from the two blocks creates new mass making the mass of the combined block larger than the mass of its constituents, the two blocks separately. Likewise, this is what happens in the nucleus. Protons and neutrons need some energy to form a nucleus, but when they collide with each other and stop, this kinetic energy has nowhere to go. So, it creates more mass. Thus, when we split the nucleus, some of this energy is released. Beta decay is a process that ejects an electron at high speed out of the nucleus. Beta decay turns a neutron into a proton, electron, and antineutrino. It might be unusual that a nucleus can emit an electron, despite only containing protons and neutrons. But atoms can also emit photons, and photons aren't part of atoms at all. Instead, they're created with energy, like electrons. Around the 1940s, Enrico Fermi predicted that the neutron could penetrate and collide with the nucleus due to it not being affected by any columbic repulsion force, since it was electrically neutral. So, he and his colleagues began firing neutrons upon various elements, forming new radioactive ones, and the theory of nuclear fission soon begun. Nuclear fission is a process in which the nucleus of an atom is split into two or smaller nuclei after bombardment with neutrons, releasing a huge amount of energy. This process is typically initiated by the absorption of the neutron by a nucleus of a heavy atom, such as uranium or plutonium. This reaction releases even more neutrons, which collide with even more radioactive atoms that continue the process over and over again, creating a self-sustaining reaction. That means under the right conditions, nuclear fission can create a chain reaction that can harvest in a large amount of energy from radioactive atoms. Okay, now we understand nuclear fission and how it can release tremendous amounts of energy. So now let's talk about what this video is all about nuclear reactors. 
we first need to understand where everything begins. Well, for a nuclear reactor, the entire process begins with water. The entire reactor should be located near a source of water, like a river or ocean, where water will be pumped into the reactor. First, here is what a nuclear reactor looks like. It is composed of three main components. The reactor core, the reactor coolant, and the turbine. The reactor core creates the energy, the reactor coolant regulates the temperature and circulates this energy, and the turbine transforms this energy into a usable form like electricity. First off, we have the reactor core. This is where the fission process will occur. There are many assemblies, or bundles, of fuel rods. These rods contain pellets of radioactive material, such as uranium-235. They are placed in a container typically filled with water. During the fission process, the radioactive atoms will be bombarded by neutrons, which split the atom in two. This releases energy in the form of radiation, which heats the water. The two smaller nuclei resulting from the fission are usually unstable and radioactive, which eventually turns into nuclear waste. The material surrounding the fuel rods acts as what we call a moderator, and it is usually just water. The released neutrons collide with the water molecules and slow them down so the reaction is more likely to occur. Over 90% of nuclear reactors use light water as their moderator, which is the same thing as normal drinking water. So, why do we call it light water instead of just water then? Well, we need to differentiate this moderator with another one called heavy water, which uses a heavier isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, making the liquid about 11% heavier than normal water. Water usually fulfills both the role of a coolant to keep the rods cool and a moderator to slow down the neutrons for the fission process. So, you might be wondering, how does the coolant not mix with the moderator since they will both be inside the reactor core at the same time during the process. The answer to this is that there are barriers and structures within the reactor core that keeps the moderators inside near the fuel rods and separates them from the reactor coolant which flows around these barriers and absorbs the heat while doing so. One more component located inside the reactor core are the control rods. They absorb neutrons flowing around in the moderator prevent further fission from occurring. These rods can be removed or inserted based on the needs of the reactor. Removing the rods will allow the fission process to continue, while inserting them will allow the operator to control the rate of the reaction and stop it entirely if necessary. The reactor coolant is the fluid that circulates through the reactor core in a nuclear reactor to transfer heat away from the fuel and carry it to a heat exchanger. The reactor coolant is an essential component of all nuclear reactors, as it helps to regulate the temperature and pressure in the reactor core and ensures the safe and efficient operation of the reactor. The reactor cooling is carefully monitored and controlled to make sure that it remains at a safe temperature and pressure and to prevent any leaks or contamination of the environment. The final component of a nuclear reactor is the turbine. It is in charge of turning the thermal energy produced by the reactor core into mechanical energy, which can then be used to create electricity. The turbine consists of a series of blades or vanes that are mounted on a rotor, which is connected to the generator. As the steam flows through the turbine, it causes the blades to rotate, which in turn rotates the rotor and generates electricity. In pressurized water reactors, this steam comes from a secondary cooling system, which is shown in the green here, where heat is transferred from the core into the system and steam is generated. But in boiling water reactors, the steam is generated directly from the core. But there is a more exotic way to get energy from atoms, fusing them. But if atoms release energy when you split them through nuclear fission, how would atoms release energy again when you fuse them together? It seems like the opposite should happen. They should lose energy. However, it really depends on what atom you choose. Protons normally repel each other due to columbic forces of repulsion. But if you bring them close enough together, a force called the strong force, which acts on small distances, pulls them together. 
The force actually isn't the pure strong force, but more of a London dispersion strong force, which creates quark anti quark pairs as a means of interaction. The strong force is sort of like a rubber band, and if you get far enough away, it snaps. The binding energy is how much energy it takes for all of these rubber bands to snap, and it's what gives these atoms the extra mass in nuclear fission. Looking at a graph for the binding energy per nucleon versus the number of nucleons in an element, we see that for higher elements like uranium, it's more favorable to go left to elements with less nucleons because it releases energy, since elements that are lighter than uranium have higher binding energies. But when we look at the pure left side of the graph, we see that for elements like hydrogen and helium, it's more favorable to go right since elements that are more massive have higher binding energies. Using this, we can see why stars at max can fuse up to iron in their core. It's the maximum, and any other nucleon wouldn't be thermodynamically favorable. It would either fuse back into it or undergo fission and split back into it. Now, we can see why fusion gives a lot more energy than fission, because the binding energy difference for fusion is a lot greater than for fission. Fusion reactors are advanced energy systems designed to create electricity by harnessing this power. In a fusion reactor, the fuel is typically a hydrogen isotope like deuterium or tritium, which is heated to extremely high temperatures and pressures until it becomes a plasma. The plasma is then confined using magnetic fields or inertial confinement, and the heat generated by this reactor is used to generate electricity. The most widely used nuclear reactor is called the tokamak which uses magnetic fields in toroidal or donut-shaped chambers to confine the plasma and begin the fusion process. Once the temperature reaches high enough, a deuterium atom and a tritium atom fuse together to make an alpha particle or a helium nuclei and a neutron with really high kinetic energy. This neutron then goes to make more tritium atoms from a lithium blanket, which kickstarts the process all over again. The problem with nuclear fusion is it takes a lot of energy to sustain this process. And we can't keep this reaction going for a long enough time period to actually gain energy from it. Nuclear energy has been an invaluable resource, but there have been various incidents that have shown its possible pitfalls and dangers. Events such as the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl shouldn't control our fear, but serve to guide society towards a brighter future. It's kind of funny how one little accident completely transformed our world. Whether it be for the better, or for the worse.